Getabook.today presents the Praetorian Imperative. Book 6 in the Starship Expeditionary Fleet Series by Shane Lachlan Black. Copyright 2019. Epsilon Gamma 3 is a long way from the nearest population center, Jason said. You're only half a light year from Proximan space, and not that much further from Imperial territory. I'm sure you get all kinds of unique personalities landing here for all kinds of unique purposes. I can't help but tell you, Captain. It breaks my heart. Used to be a man could settle down on this rock, plant a field, start a family. Now it's become every man for himself. Most of the fellas my age have moved on. Some retired. Some went on to glory. Pamela returned to the room. Jason couldn't be sure, but she looked as if she had been crying. She tried to hide the fact she was composing herself by busying with the dishes. Please, allow me. Jason rose and began stacking his plates. Don't be silly. Stay and chat. I'll get you some more coffee. She hurried from the room, partly to avoid the dishes toppling and partly to continue regrouping. Hunter looked after the young woman for a moment. It's been hard on everyone toughest on the mothers. We never know when the kids might encounter something dangerous on the road or by the river. Those ships can cover a lot of distance. One of the villages up north shut off access to the highway and took down one of the power stations. Caused all kinds of trouble. Irrigation systems were out for days. About cost one of our farms a hundred head. Gave the rioters ideas. One of them said as much. How are you fixed for supplies if you get cut off? Water is the problem. We've got food enough for months, but a lot of our fresh water is synthesized and distributed through the irrigation right-of-way. We have a local public use district, but the problem is, anyone with access can disrupt supplies upstream if they're of a mind to do it. And if we spare the manpower to guard the right-of-way, we don't have enough rifles to protect the village. There's an Alliance civilian provost on EG3, Hunter replied. Have they been contacted? Perhaps they can supplement your supplies. Rack hesitated and looked down at his half-empty coffee cup. Provost's wife? He cleared his throat. She up and disappeared one day. Search party was deputized, didn't find much. Turns out the raiders took her along with a half-dozen others. Hunter saw the faraway look. Mr. Hansen? Pamela returned with a fresh cup for the captain and froze in her tracks. They was all hanged. Said it was to let the governor know they was serious. Provis shot himself in the head with a kinetic the next day. Survived, but he's been in a coma ever since. Rack cleared his throat again. This attempt to compose himself wasn't as successful. Excuse me for a bit. He got up and went upstairs. Pamela finally set the coffee down and took her seat. Again she moved as if she were trying to prevent a bomb from going off. My apologies, Captain. I know you were only accepting an invitation to breakfast, she said softly. I'm sorry if I seemed rude before. The boys shouldn't be hearing their grandfather like this. Think nothing of it. This isn't the first time I've come across problems like this in civilian colonies. Pamela smiled weakly. Is there nobody planetside who can confront these thugs? I'd heard stories about civilian planet raiders in the Reach, but I had no idea they were defying local governments and officials all the way out here. We were told the Corps Council was planning to send more men and more police, but so far we haven't seen any response. They burned two floors of the hospital a week ago, stole a portable power station and a shipment of frozen food. We've been making do. An oven bell went off in the kitchen. Pamela stood and almost fell as her knees buckled. Jason caught her and helped her stand again. Pamela looked into the captain's eyes with an expression of desperate hope. She didn't speak. 
Hunter knew she was waiting for one reassuring word. Anything to dispel the crushing darkness that threatened everything she knew. I don't have much to offer. I'm afraid one day my boys will... He had to say something. I give you my word as a Skywatch officer. Like all young mothers, all Pamela wanted to hear was that everything would be all right. I will personally see to it these raids end. Mrs. Hansen burst into tears and hugged Captain Hunter tightly. He comforted her, wondering what the hell he had just signed up for. One thing was certain. Whoever the raiders were, they couldn't be allowed anywhere near Cornelius's compound. Heaven alone knew what the retired general had hidden in his underground complex. If he unleashed it on the raiders, the last thing they'd have to worry about would be civilian law enforcement or Skywatch. What Hunter needed was an unconventional ally, someone with the same borderline tendencies as the young captain. The only problem was Hunter had nothing to bribe her with, yet. Chapter 6 I hear you two make up the key membership of my brother's secret science society. Zoni and Yili both had to admit Jace Hunter was way ahead of her contemporaries when it came to looking sharp under fire. She was dressed in her most intimidating black-on-black -black battle dress and armed with what looked like a brand new TK-12 with a laser sight. The three officers occupied Psy Key's observation deck, such as it was. Visible through the frigate-sized viewport was the starship Minstrel, ever at Jace's side, it seemed. Already seated at the four-person table was the Master Chief. I forgot my card and secret handshake, Zoni replied, rocking on her heels once. Jace invited engineer and signals expert to be seated. Buckmaster handed them each an electronic reader. Jason's given me the 30-000-foot view, and he managed to supply me with prototypes, parts, and plans. But I want the real story from the chicks who invented them. It was all smoke and mirrors, ma'am. All we invented were some cool sound effects, Yili replied. Buckmaster grinned. Argent left home with modern tech and returned with the future. Like everything else, necessity was the driving force. We can't take credit for the gunship AI. The rest is all theory put into practice with enough time and equipment, Yili said. Tell me about Black Nine. What are that ship's true capabilities? All four Psy Key crew members called up the after-action reports on Black Nine's combat performance at Bayonne 3. It's a self-directed strategic operations Cephalon Matrix, Zoni said. It's also self-aware, so it understands its sense of purpose and duty. It responds to the chain of command, and considers itself a member of the crew as opposed to a simple piece of equipment used by the crew. Very similar in overall operation to your minibots, ma'am, Yili added. Jace nodded. As you can understand, I'm rather intrigued by all this. But before we go any further, I need to tell you a story. Do either of you remember Abran Willits? Zoni smiled. We do. She got caught up in the Sarn Invector engagement over Bioni 3. Turned out she had established a rapport with the damaged battle computer aboard Black 7. We didn't realize it until it was too late, but her interactions with the computer's strategy bank may have been the event that gave birth to Black 9's advanced AI. Well, now it seems Miss Willits has moved on to one of my minibots. I had no idea any of this was going on until after we debriefed Komanov's ground crew at the 14th Infantry Garrison. After they were all restricted by my orders, Echo and Black Nine apparently cooked up a scheme whereby they could improve their own combat capabilities, and they were only a short distance from Starhaven. Apparently the autonomous fighter programming you invented had been appropriated by my minibots without authorization. Black Nine incorporated it, improved upon it, and managed to run more than 116 million simulations pitting it against all of the strategic and tactical training challenges in the Skywatch database. In fact, it wrote several hundred of its own. Oh, wow, Zoni said in her now famous faraway voice. Only a matter of time. We would have fed the AI the same simulations to improve its capabilities, Yili said. Exactly what we would have expected. It just did the work itself. I realize we need a psychoelectronics expert out here to evaluate all this. But what would you say the approximate mental age of the AI inside Black Nine is? Jace asked. I'll answer that, Buckmaster interrupted. It sounds like about an eight or nine year old boy, just like my nephews. One part idealism, nine parts tree climbing. Zoni made a delighted face. That's the best description I've ever heard. Even Yili smiled. There's a reason I made little tiny mini bots instead of big bots, Jace said. Rebel is about as well armed as the average cop. He can take on a handful of opponents, and if he opens up with full power, he can employ deadly force. 
He has hardware interlocks to prevent that, of course. But that's the extent of the damage he can do, other than denting your front door. You're about to point out that... We have an eight-year-old boy who thinks about two billion times faster than we do armed with Mark I brawler cannons, panic reactors, and high-capacity battle screens. He can also operate in both surface and orbital warfare modes with or without a pilot, and he thinks you're his mom. Jace directed her last statement at Zoni. Me? Yes, you. Black Nine was listening when you reassured Abren and managed to get them back on Argent's flight deck. It responded exactly the same way she did, at least emotionally. Every conversation we have with it now, it reminds us part of its mission is to protect you and Abren. Yili reached over and grabbed Zoni's shoulder as the signals chief covered her face with her hands. Congratulations, Commander. It's a boy. That's not funny. The look on the Master Chief's face said otherwise. Joking aside, Nine is picking up capabilities at an alarming rate, Jace added. By our admittedly crude estimates, that thing is now roughly 200% to 400% more combat effective than any other model of Tarantula Hawk platform. And everything it learns, it is sharing with my mini-bots. They're doing exactly what little kids do. Sharing and learning together. Before long, they'll be encouraging each other to go on adventures and finding someone to pick on, Yili said. There you go, Buckmaster replied. A bully who can fly 40 miles a second armed with a surface warfare weapons loadout. I hope one of you has the schematics for a big electric leash. Jace called up an historical file on her tablet. Let me tell you how all this got started. Two months earlier. The third of Yili Curtis's three reactor stations supplying the 14th Infantry Garrison's Iron Keep complex west of the village of Starhaven had no human personnel assigned, at least not permanently. There were regular visits from Marine enlisted technicians to make certain the magnetic screens were still working, but other than that, it was very quiet at Station 3. Major Darya Komanov's Marine contingent had established a rock solid foothold on the Bayoni surface and had wisely spent the majority of their time digging in and reinforcing their position. When the disruption wave hit the Argent landing force, 14th Infantry was spared the brunt of its impact. It wasn't immediately clear what had caused the energy release, but what was clear was it either caused or accelerated the withdrawal of the long-expected invasion force. The alien attackers had done considerable damage in the meantime. The strike fleet was down three ships, one of which was still disabled on the planet's surface after a harrowing plunge from orbit into the sea near the Windward Island chain east of Starhaven's valuable agricultural region. DSS Exeter's crew had suffered casualties, but had managed to survive and conduct repairs despite the disabling effects of the energy blast that had largely disabled Captain Hunter's ground forces. The Yurjin and Sarn forces had no detectable spacehead, so it was likely they had retreated to their own bases on the surface somewhere nearby. Finding those bases was a priority, but keeping Argent's forces alive was a higher priority. Because it had gone down well south of Point Sierra, Paladin 6-4 had been recovered and repaired with Sergeant Alexander and Sable's help. Although the sergeant's scanners had located and isolated the position of the gate to Hallow's Moon, by the time Komanov's recon teams arrived, it had vanished somehow. The surviving elements of Argent's Star Wing and Mechanized Battalion had been recovered and stationed near Komanov's garrison with 6th Armor. They were operational and mobile. Nevertheless, they didn't have anywhere to go or anyone to fight. Bayone 3 was quiet, and all the Skywatch units were at nominal readiness. The Major had even authorized limited liberty for short visits to Starhaven, which thrilled the local merchants and tended to soothe the hair trigger everyone had been on for days. The peace and serenity that had finally arrived was a welcome respite for the humans. For the machinery and electronics, on the other hand, things were a little more tense. None of the officers, marines, or crewmen were aware of it, but a more and more urgent conversation had been going on between several of Skywatch's robotic and artificially intelligent auxiliaries, and the nexus of that conversation was Reactor Station 3, 16.4 nautical miles southwest of the garrison. Station 3 was one of the reactor facilities Commander Curtis had established with the crew of the Copernicus Engineering Corvette for the purpose of supplying ground forces with power. It was also the furthest of the stations from Point Sierra and the least likely to be attacked. This was one of the reasons the urgency of the ongoing electronic summit would have been more than a little confusing for Komanov and her officers. 
The minibots were deployed at various positions around the center of Station 3, where an underground capsule fusion reactor assembly had been installed. Aside from the power unit, the only other structures visible above ground were a set of lightweight magnetic emitters for the station's protective screens. Four of the emitters were currently guarded by at least one minibot. Rebel, the group's heavy armored unit which looked like a fat camouflage tank, was responsible for the south approach. Wave, the armed ground transport half-track, was watching the west edge. Intercept, the mobile security unit built to look like a sleek police car, was watching east, and Echo, the communications and trauma unit, was responsible for the north. Lunar, the tiny rocket-shaped spacecraft and butterfly, the helicopter aerial transport, were circling overhead at an altitude of 30 to 50 feet. The other unit attending the meeting was Tarantula Hawk gunship Black 9, parked in Chief Engineer Curtis's repair facility 16 miles away at the 14th Infantry Garrison. This information is accurate? Affirmative. Echo transmitted Black 9's upload to the rest of the minibots. The Mark II fusion torpedo is your mission? Affirmative. This unit was activated by order of Chief Engineer Yili Curtis. I successfully deployed the new weapon system against single-seat fighter opposition during a test witnessed by Captain Jason Hunter. I am now under orders from Commander Jace Hunter as part of her surface warfare squadron. So are we, Echo exclaimed. Do you want to be a minibot with us? Hey, Echo, Wave interrupted. I don't think a gunship can be a minibot. Okay, he can be our first superbot. That would be neat, Intercept said. Why do we need superbots? Rebel asked. Because now we can all get rides to wherever we want to go, Echo replied. Gunships are huge! Sarn and Yurjan enemy forces are regrouping on the Bayonne 3 surface. I do not have authorization to engage the enemy at this time. But they must be located and neutralized. We must protect the citizens of Starhaven. How can you help if you can't use your weapons? Echo asked referring to Jace's standing orders to Black Nine not to engage without authorization. I cannot deploy my weapons, but I am not without options, Black Nine replied. I cannot disobey the orders of my commander, but my mission is clear. If I am able to compute a mission plan, will you and your mini-bot units agree to join me? What mission plan? Butterfly asked. Jace ordered us to guard the reactor. And that's what we did, so we did good, Rebel declared but Jace would tell us to go fight the enemy if they were out there and they were going to come attack us, right? Lunar asked. Where? Rebel demanded. What are the enemy's coordinates? Black Nine doesn't have those yet, Echo replied. I can obtain them with your assistance. How? The Starship Constellation has launched a series of replacement lookdown probes in low orbit over Bayone 3. These probes were launched in order to assist with missile targeting against surface contacts. I have obtained access to their telemetry link with the garrison data net. With some adjustments, we can use them to localize the enemy formations and prepare a battle plan. However, first I need the assistance of my former commander. Who is your former commander? Butterfly asked. Abren Willits, call sign Parakeet. Echo performed another complete scan of the data upload provided by Black Nine. She immediately directed her attention to the accounts of the crash of gunship Black Seven near Starhaven, and the subsequent reactivation of the vessel with Abran at the controls. What Echo didn't miss that most humans would have, however, was the telemetry recovered from Black 7 prior to its repair. Jace's little communications unit was built to resemble a toy ambulance roughly the size of a large picnic cooler and complete with all the accessories one might expect of an emergency medical transport, including a complete assortment of lights and sirens. Echo's appearance led many to dismiss her opinions about combat matters. But all those who jumped to the wrong conclusions rapidly changed their viewpoints when confronted with the little unit's data processing capacity and her propensity for charging into combat zones to rescue Skywatch personnel. What Echo had found in the data was the complete record of Abren and Black Seven's self-directed guessing games. As she analyzed the information, a pattern emerged. Between the cybernetic relays of Black Seven's battle computer and Abren's bright imagination, the two contestants had performed a complete study of basic strategy without knowing it. The portion of Black Seven's Cephalon identity that had absorbed the knowledge and strategic probability matrix constructed by the series of guessing games had subsequently split from the instance of Argent's command computer installed on all the battleship's Starwing spacecraft. Echo instinctively understood the ramifications of the exercise and compared it to her own combat routines. 
This new identity had become what Commander Curtis called the Lazarus Entity. The new intelligence had been bypassed during the disaster over Bione III, which had given it time to learn what it needed to know in order to properly function as part of the battleship Argent's operations. It subsequently installed itself to subsume the battle computer's function aboard Black Nine. It had evolved once again. Now Black Nine was, for all intents and purposes, a self-aware artificially intelligent warship, and it was on a mission. An electronic negotiation ensued between Black Nine and the Little Ambulance. Echo provided the portions of her own combat programming that did not appear in the gunship's self-developed protocol. In exchange, Black Nine simply expanded its own programming to include all of Echo's experience as alternative heuristics. Both units were now capable of not only using their combined combat experience as a guide in future conflicts, but they were prepared to cooperate and coordinate their operations. Moments later, Echo shared what she had just learned with the rest of the minibots. Now Black Nine had six allies. Why do you need Parakeet? Wave asked. She will verify the accuracy and precision of Commander Curtis and Commander Tixia's modifications to the Wildcat Pursuit Routines and the engagement envelope for the Jaguar Mark II Fusion Torpedo Heavy Weapon System. How? By playing games with us. Games? We get to play games? Echo asked excitedly. Affirmative. But first we must find Parakeet. And then I must obtain authorization to modify my space frame to support a primary fusion torpedo and jackrabbit point defense loadout. But you said Jace wouldn't let you. I am prohibited from conducting operations or deploying weapons. If this unit comes under attack, or if urgent conditions preclude advance clearance, I am authorized to conduct combat operations without the express authorization of my commanding officer. So, how can we play games then? Intercept asked. I am not prohibited from conducting simulated combat operations. Simulated? Affirmative. All we must do is establish contact with Parakeet and help her configure her comlink to connect to this unit's surface warfare systems. Butterfly will go, Rebel announced. I'm scared, the little helicopter replied. I don't want to go alone. Lunar should go too, Echo offered. Then we won't have any air support, Wave pointed out. I will go, Rebel said. Starhaven is twenty miles away. Abren will be in high school before you get there, old buddy, Wave replied. I will go, Echo said. Intercept, Rebel and Wave will form a three-point equidistant perimeter, and Lunar and Butterfly will maintain aerial surveillance. I can reach Starhaven in just over one hour. Righteous, Wave cheered. Very well, Black Nine said. I will upload the instructions during transit. Minutes later, Echo was maintaining a cruising speed of just over 24 miles per hour. She was aware of all the relevant village ordinances regarding traffic, livestock, and lawful use of both paved and unpaved roads. She was making use of the straight thoroughfare between the village's water treatment facility and the residential district, which made things considerably easier for the small vehicle than navigating uneven ground, creek beds, and scrub brush. Since she was ostensibly on Skywatch business, her light bars were active, giving her at least nominal priority over other traffic. So far, the only other vehicles she had been required to avoid were two kids on bicycles, obviously out without permission. Even though the hostilities had abated, the village was still on heightened civil defense alert. Echo didn't have time to read the two teenagers the riot act, however. Time was critical. In another half hour or so, the larger of the two bay own primaries would set, leaving Echo on battery power only. She was operating at more than 98% reserves, however, meaning she could still travel a good 60 miles before her internal safety and power preservation routines forced her off the road to wait until sunrise when she could begin regenerating her battery reserves again. Echo opened up her Skywatch frequency scanners and began broadcasting a regular series of sweeps across the Starhaven residential district. She received electronic responses from two civilian repeaters at ranges of between three and seven miles and immediately localized the devices. Both were installed on 40-foot tall antenna mounts. One was at the north edge of the district, while the other was at the far southeastern corner. Echo immediately recognized the repeaters gave her an excellent triangulation overlay, which covered more than 88% of the residential district. The little ambulance arrived at an intersection and turned the corner towards several rows of houses. She transmitted military overrides to both of the units 
and reconfigured them to process and retransmit her own signals. The resulting boost in power immediately localized the only Skywatch comlink in the area. Echo reconfigured her narrowband emergency transmitter and activated all the fleet hailing frequencies at once. She slowed and rolled past porches, front yards, and mailboxes with her lights flashing. Parakeet, this is Echo broadcasting on Skywatch hailing frequency range 871. Acknowledge receipt of transmission and report status to mobile ground station 4 Sunflower Delta. Standing by. The minibot's internal clock reset the hailing timer as she transferred full power to her receivers and EM scanners. Parakeet, this is Echo broadcasting on Skywatch hailing frequency range 871. Acknowledge receipt of transmission and report status to mobile ground station 4 Sunflower Delta. Standing by. The receiver crackled. Echo activated her external speakers. Hello? Who is this? Echo analyzed the voice. Based on the sample and the equipment in use, she concluded it belonged to a human woman in her mid-thirties. This is Echo. I am assigned to the Perseus Task Force Medical Corps aboard the Starship Fury under the command of Captain Jace Hunter. I am trying to reach a brain Willits, call sign Parakeet, on urgent Skywatch business. At that moment, Echo arrived at the Willits residence and rolled into the tiny house's driveway. My surface scanners indicate you are transmitting from a location approximately nine yards north-northwest my position. There was a short pause. Echo sat in the driveway as her rotating red lights swept the structures on both sides of the street. A couple of the neighbors peered out their windows, wondering why there was an ambulance the size of a large toaster parked across the street. Finally, the front door of the residence clicked and opened a few inches. A shadowy figure peered out. Echo maneuvered herself to the porch and deactivated her emergency lights before pulling up to the doorway. Hi, is Abran home? Mrs. Willits needed a moment. It wasn't very often that residents of a farming colony found themselves having a conversation with a talking ambulance. Yes, what is this regarding? It's for Skywatch. We need her help so we can learn to play games together. I thought we weren't supposed to be involved in the military situation anymore. Mom, what is it? The girl peered around her mother to see who had come to call. Hi, are you Abran? Echo exclaimed. Uh-huh. The girl didn't look any more sure of herself than her mother. Do you want to play a game? It will help us beat the bad guys. Abran lit up. Like when I helped Dominique? Mrs. Willits and her daughter exchanged looks. The mother looked exhausted. Abran looked delighted, bouncing on her toes and clasping her hands. Can I, Mom? This isn't going to bring any more of those colony raiders back to the village, is it? Mrs. Willits asked. If the bad guys attack, we can help you. I have lots of friends who can help. May I enter the structure? Mrs. Willits opened the door further, and Echo rolled into the dwelling's utilitarian living room. My new friend Black Nine taught me how to play games on your comlink, and if we win, it will help us beat the bad guys if they come and try to hurt us again. Can I show you? Abren collected the comlink and was halfway to her room when her mother snagged the collar of her shirt. Hold it! No leaving the house and you turn everything off in an hour for bed! There was general agreement and enthusiastic nodding before the girl raced down the short hallway to the bedroom with Echo following. Mrs. Willits wandered towards the kitchen to find something to clean and take her mind off the fact her nine-year-old daughter had apparently joined the Marines. The bedroom door clicked shut. Abren plopped down on the floor cross-legged, and expertly called up the general interface on the comlink. Like this? She showed the screen to Echo. Affirmative. You sound just like Dominique. Abran raised a fist. I affirmative. I know you helped teach the battleship Argent's command computer how to play guessing games. I know that's boots and that's checkers too. Echo pointed a narrow targeting beam at each of the plush animals in turn. If you can play our new games as well as the ones before... Then Black Nine and all my mini-bot friends will be ready to fight if there's trouble. I was scared when the bad guys came to our village. Echo hesitated a moment. Are you still scared? Kind of. You don't have to be scared anymore. All the people of Starhaven are safe now. Dominique protected us. And Captain Hunter let us have ice cream on the big battleship. Look! Abran practically leaped across the room to retrieve her four sizes too big red buccaneers flight jacket. I'm in Zoni's Pilots Club! Echo's always active safety systems focused on Abran's arm. What is the cause of the injury to your right elbow? Abran's hair flopped over as she lifted her elbow and looked. 
Oh, that's just an owie I got when I was roller skating with my friend Lacey. Place your elbow in front of my forward optical pickup, Echo said as she reoriented herself to face the girl. A brand collapsed into a splayed kneeling position that would have likely left anyone over the age of 30 hospitalized for weeks. Hold your arms still for a moment, Echo said. Her forward biomatic scanner performed a cutaneous evaluation of the abrasion. A brief scan indicated a low-grade skin infection which was instantly wiped out by an ultraviolet sterilization procedure. Echo's side storage bay opened, a medical treatment sleeve wrapped around the girl's arm. What's that? It's how I make patients better if they get hurt. Is it bad? You'll be okay. Watch this. The sleeve slipped off and folded back into Echo's chassis. The abrasion was gone. A Brent's face lit up like she had just seen a magic trick. Did you do that? Affirmative. AC showed me how. Who's AC? Jace Hunter. She's our commander. We call her AC because that's a nickname her brother Jason gave her. I like Captain Jason. He's nice. I wish he would come back and visit us again. Is Jace nice like the captain is? Affirmative. She built all of us. She even fixed Intercept after he got blasted in our last battle. We were worried about him, but he's all better now. All the other minibots are back at base, and they can't wait to play games with us. Abren settled on the floor and faced Echo Eyes to headlights with her chin in her hands. Do you want to be my best friend? What is a best friend? The girl looked up as if trying to think of a good answer. She tapped her chin with a finger. It's like we spend time together and have fun. We talk about stuff and make each other feel better if we're sad. Are you sad? Abren shook her head. Nope. Are you? I'm not sad. I don't know if I'm programmed to have fun or talk about stuff. We're talking about stuff now. Then it is reasonable to assume I'm also having fun. Abren giggled. You're funny. I will be your best friend, Echo replied. Abran didn't realize it, and neither would any member of Argent's or Fury's crew for some weeks. But Echo's decision to become the girl's best friend had not only altered the communications unit's core programming, but it changed the Minibots and Black Nine's relationship with Parakeet. Where once there had been five and then six, now there were eight. Seven cybernetic personalities and one human, all ostensibly about the same age from a mental and emotional development standpoint. No cybernetic scientist could have dreamed up the possibilities from a simple organic progression standpoint. Far more important, however, was the fact these eight minds were about to participate in one of the most unique strategy training simulations ever conducted. Abran, for her part, just wanted to have fun and be best friends. Black Nine was eagerly seeking more knowledge and more ways to improve its combat readiness. The minibots were carrying out the programming they had acquired when they were invented by Commander Hunter. They were three different types of minds, and they were about to share experience and knowledge in ways that even PhD-level researchers never would have imagined. The other strategic priority that had emerged as a result of Echo's agreement was as unpredictable as it was irreversible. A Bren Willits was now a priority one protected target, just like Commander Hunter, Echo's other best friend. The girl went to her little desk and retrieved a small book. She took a pink heart sticker off one of the pages and affixed it to Echo's forward chassis. Then she took another sticker and affixed it to her own cheek. Now we're heart friends. Minutes later, with Echo's help, the comlink had been connected to a scrambled data link with all the other minibots and gunship Black Nine. Abren was flat on the floor, holding the device up in both hands with her elbows planted on the carpet and her feet propped up on the wall. Next to her, Echo observed and maintained the data link. On the screen, strategic problems were presented in gradually increasing levels of complexity. First, it was guiding sailboats and their cargo along a river. Next, it was scheduling feeding time for a litter of puppies. Then it was a resource allocation dilemma involving lanterns and fuel oil. All eight participants, the Minibots, Black Nine and Abren, did their best to navigate each challenge and then interpret the results. The electronic minds exchanged information instantly. Then they had conversations with a brain over the battalion net. Black Nine was satisfied at the progress being made. Its own combat readiness had increased nearly 4% during the three quarters of an hour the games had been underway. At this rate, it was likely its attack and defense pattern selection routines would exceed their design parameters in a matter of a few days. Working with a human girl was slow by electronic standards. But the truth was, there was no electronic equivalent to her imagination. 
Abren's mind analyzed problems intuitively, rather than deductively, something which fascinated the combat units and their artificial minds. Her solutions were frequently unexpected. The electronic participants rapidly learned to avoid conflict-based simulations. The one program they ran to try and gauge reaction time and target selection produced a completely unexpected result. Abren simply gave up. The minibots and especially Black Nine weren't prepared for such a result, and at first they had no way of knowing how to respond.